BBC Radio Kent. The Conversation on BBC Radio Kent with Dominic King. Tonight on the show, Sunil Rapacina, who is a barrister who runs a boutique road traffic defence practice called Kent Traffic Law. He's always so busy. He's found time to join me on the programme tonight. Hello, how are you? Yes, very well, thank you, Dominic. Nice to have you back on the programme. Yeah, good to be here. Busy as ever? Absolutely. Yeah. What, what kind of routine have you had in the last uh, few weeks? I'm thinking of summertime. Does that change anything for your business? Possibly a little bit more drinking and driving in the summer. Um, I think maybe people go out, have a few extra pints and tempted to drive home, that kind of thing maybe. Uh, that's interesting. So uh, how does that work with phone calls that come to you and you have to then work out what the situation might be? So, for example, I've, I've had a case the last couple of days where I met a client and what happens is I, I, t- I give very frank advice. If clients are giving me an account which, frankly, I think won't be believed by a court, I tell them. Of course, it's up to the client if they want to stick to it, but um, I try and tell them the hurdles and sometimes they change and put forward a guilty plea, which is in everyone's interest. If they insist they want to fight it, I'm happy to do that. It's not for me to judge. But the reason I'm just saying this is because of a, an account the client gave me the other day. He spent two hours giving me this account. At the end, I gave him some very frank advice. And he said, Sunil, can I meet you again? I want to change my account. So we've arranged another meeting. And I suspect he'll give a much franker account next time and probably tender a guilty plea. So sometimes, actually, a big part of what you do is to be a realist on behalf of the individual. You've got all the facts that they're giving you. You've got the background knowledge of the law. You understand what uh, a judge uh, or a magistrate might think and, um, and, and understand where their boundaries are. So actually, it's not just about saying, oh, yeah, you know, um, give me the money and I'll, I'll represent you. you. You have that code of ethics, which means you, you've got to be pretty full on and straight with the person yeah our code of conduct as a barrister says that we must give frank and straightforward advice and although the public perception is you barristers just get people off actually that's a little unfair because uh, as you're saying i frankly regard it as part of my job and a big part of my job to be honest with clients so that it's entirely up to them if they wish to maintain an account it's not for me to judge But having spent 25 years in the courts, day in, day out, I've got a good idea straight away whether their account is likely to be believed by magistrates. This was a real departure for you, though, wasn't it, to to do this job that you're now doing out of Maidstone, to be be part of, um, to to have Kent Traffic Law as your boutique business? Because you were working in chambers, you were you were working in criminal cases, you, you've been at the Old Bailey over that career. When was the point where you thought, this is my specialty, I actually know a lot about this and I want to move it forward? Well, when I started in this profession, it was very, very restricted and limited in what you could do. At that time, the public couldn't instruct a barrister directly, they had to go through a solicitor. But in recent years, they liberalised that and said the public can come straight to a barrister if they know the area of specialisation they require. So when that happened, I thought, well, look, there must be an area of law where I can move away from my chambers in London and set up on my own. And road traffic offences are an aspect of criminal law. So I thought, well, this is it. Let's see if I can set this up. And that's what I've been doing the last few years. So some of the topics that have come up today, uh, we'll start off with mobile apps and parking. Now, I'm sure there's going to be people in their cars right now going, yeah, yeah. Now, I swear by using a mobile app to park uh, in, in the place where we are here, Tunbridge Wells. If I can, I'll try and find a, a space uh, on a road that gives you that um, freedom to park at certain points of the day. I'm not telling anyone where because then they'll, everyone will go there. Um, but, but sometimes, you know, I need to park uh, just close to the building here and you pay your fee for a day, by the way, very expensive expensive in summer trials just saying um and uh you know that you could got the mobile app and you press the, the buttons and it does it for you trouble is sometimes things can go slightly wrong with the system and i just wonder if it's something that you've 
come up against from um, clients who have said, look, you know, I, I got charged for this for parking in this space. I used a mobile app and it didn't quite go to plan. Um, I wonder whether technology is great, but at the same time, it's kind of flawed too. The, the robots are taking over, Sunny. Yeah, that kind of isn't really an aspect of my business because that's actually a civil matter. So parking charges, congestion charges, and if people don't pay them or they want to dispute them, that's actually a civil area. Oh, and I'm just really defending people facing criminal prosecution. But you are in Maidstone, so Maidstone has a good reputation, doesn't it, for its uh, its parking. Um, it's not always easy in the county town to park. I'm sure you, you face that. What's your own personal experience of parking? Yeah, I, I actually attended a meeting the other day. Funnily enough, this came up. And those in charge gave a statistic that most of the p p car park spaces in Maidstone are empty for most of the day. That's interesting. Now, the people there found that hard to believe, including myself. Right. But, but they they had the hard statistics. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've got... I mean, there's a gym just at one end of Maidstone. I, I tend to drive in and there's a, an overhead car park there. And on a Saturday morning, the queue for that stretches out onto the main road. It must be a nightmare, though, for uh, anyone uh, who works in, in the council when someone like yourself uh, contacts them and says, I, I've got something, I'm not too happy about this, this, this fee you're asking me to pay because you're, you, you know, you've you got the whole weight of the law. It's like Top Gun moving in. <laughs> <laughs> well, one thing about Maidstone, I noticed the... The machines there accept overpayment, but they don't give change. <laughs> I suppose they would say, well, we do put that on the machine, but I think that's a bit unreasonable. Sometimes, though, the detail is there, isn't it? Sometimes, you know, the, 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 there is the information that is there for people, but there's a difference as well that a lot of people talk about, the kind of between the, uh, the parking fine that you might get given by a council and the parking fine that you might get from uh, a company that is representing... Um, well, themselves, but 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 the people who own the building of a car park, and they're, they're very different things. I think you can even notice that they're, they're they're written differently too. And there's always areas, and I guess that that's the point where a lot of people kind of either representing themselves have to work on. Yeah, if you get a notice from the police or the council, that's a penalty charge notice, a PCN. What some private companies do, they call their notices parking charge notices as opposed to penalty charge notices so the public probably aren't aware a lot of the time that they don't necessarily have an official sanction behind them and <clears throat> the area where it gets interesting is that if you park in a car park and everything's prima facie clear in theory you're entering a contract with those people so it's actually the law of contract which governs whether you need to pay that fine but these companies aren't allowed just to say, right, you overstayed by five minutes or you were an inch over the line, we're going to fine you £100. That They don't have a right to fine at all. The relationship is governed by contract. Have you ever represented anyone? Yes, it's uh, civil as opposed to criminal, but have you, have you represented someone just because you thought, actually, I know the language that needs to be used here? Any, any, any friends or um, people you've met along the way? Well, funnily enough, a few months ago, my, I got a phone call from my wife and she'd been to London for the day, parked in the station car park. When she got back, she had a ticket. Of course, she rang me up. <laughs> so I... I Sunil, just, <laughs> sort it. <laughs> yeah, quite. I just told her, photograph all around the car, photograph the signs, photograph everything, come home. And what had happened, when she'd arrived at the car park that day, there'd been a sort of diluvial downpour and she'd parked in the last bay of a row... And when she came back, she had the ticket. And when I looked at the photographs, I could see that on the off side of the last bay of the row, there wasn't actually a line there. So although she thought she'd parked in a space, she hadn't. But it seemed to me, I just applied my brain and common sense, if you like, to the situation. It was the duty of the people who ran the car park to make sure that it was kept clean and the bays were clearly marked. Now, if there was a flood, OK, one can understand they didn't do it for a short period, but that's their duty. Did you really, though, Sonny, have to go to the extent of having the scenes of crime team that you knew to, to put up the, the fences, put up the, the cones and, and, you know, and take all those photographs? I mean, that's, that's quite impressive. If, if that hadn't been done, we, we would have got nowhere because yeah. 
I then drafted an appeal based on the fact that it's their duty to keep the bays clearly marked. You could see from the photograph when she returned that the water was receding more slowly on the side of the car where the line wasn't there. So there was a good inference when she parked that was completely covered and she couldn't have known it wasn't a bay. So I explained all this in clear terms in writing and the company wasn't interested, told us to get lost, It basically. I'd appealed to their better nature, they told us to get lost. So then I appealed to a higher authority and we won the appeal. So you just keep going? <laughs> Well, what occurred to me there was how unfair the system was because, frankly, if I hadn't been a lawyer and taken the time to study all the rules, all the regulations, all the facts and reduced it to writing as only a lawyer would, frankly, I don't think m most people would have got anywhere at all. So does that worry you slightly, that on a, on a sort of level of just society, that we, we don't either push it sometimes because we think authority must be right, so therefore I'm not even going to question it, and because of that, Someone's making some money somewhere. Yeah, I think it's outrageous, actually, Dom. I mean, we had the, this case of the Cardiff nurses, didn't we, where they had tens of thousands of pounds worth of fines. Now, I've not looked into that case in any kind of close detail, just out of interest, really. But how can it be right that a nurse who is meant to be provided with parking can't park because there's grossly inadequate number of spaces... And then she ends up with, t you know, some of them had tens of thousands of pounds worth of, of fines. Now tell me, uh, when you were a little boy, did you always have this urge for justice? I suppose I did, to be frank, yeah. Because that strikes me that that is very often, I know I've got, I call it the justice chip. You know, I get really infuriated if I feel someone's being unjustly treated and it really winds me up. So I, I just wonder whether that passion and drive is, is, is what pushes you on. Well, you're asking deep questions now, Don, but I, I suppose you're about right. Hold really. on, we got North Korea yet? <laughs> yeah, I suppose you're right, because I've always tended to support the underdog, whether it's a sporting contest, any kind of contest. And when it's an individual against a state, an individual against a company, my natural inclination is to help the little guy. OK, so all you've got to do now is solve North Korea with me in the next uh, four minutes. So, uh, wow, I mean, I don't know what, what, what it felt like if you saw this last night, but I, I was just going to bed and I suddenly saw all this stuff coming out of America on my smartphone and seeing all the sort of rhetoric and all the conversations going on about um, North Korea and the weapons they have and this whole possibility of them launching uh, some nuclear attack on Guam. Um an American base there, over um, uh, I think 120,000 people who who are on that that area of the island of Guam as well. So you know it, it's a serious thing, and of course what it says. And then you've got the stuff coming out from a Donald Trump uh, president saying uh, fury and fire and American might and power. Wow, um, Cuban Missile Crisis, here we go again. Um, I just wonder what your thoughts on this were. It's a huge conversation. We're not going to be able to do it in three minutes, but just what do you think about what is happening right now, 2017, and uh, without putting fear into everyone, the bottom line is some of the experts say this is a problem in a huge way. I think it is a major problem, and I don't think the situation is helped with sort of inflammatory rhetoric. Kind of action-reaction. Yeah, and when you have... I mean, Kim Jong-un must be a very frightened man. Let's face it, if he picks a fight with Goliath, he's going to lose. Um, so he's a, a bit like a caged animal, and I don't think it's prudent to constantly poke him, poke him, make him think that he's, gonna, he's on the verge of annihilation. Uh, I wonder what you might answer to this. Do you think, though, Donald Trump is being presidential here? I don't, and I think there's a risk that if he creates lines in the sand which are then crossed, that he may feel it makes him look impotent. So I must confess, as a citizen of the world, I am a bit concerned that he sticks his neck out, to use a colloquialism, and does just that. Because it strikes me that this isn't, a, uh, this isn't a, an American or a North Korean or a, a Korean, uh, so, thinking of Seoul, a uh, South Korean problem. This is, this is actually a global problem here, because if this happens, and this did happen, well, our world would change. There's no doubt about it because of the ricochet effects of, of everything, uh, which we don't need to go into absolute detail. But the point is, there is a, there is a worry of, of the, how the rhetoric 
goes beyond. But then there's part of me that also thinks that as a realist, you know, there'll be discussions going on behind the scenes. We are just seeing the representatives of those countries talking. There must be other people. The whole reason the Cuban Missile Crisis didn't go to the point of uh, with the Bay of Pigs and all the rest is because of those back channels. There must be that going on, don't you think? Well, firstly, I think that if the Russians and the Chinese get together with the Americans and vote in unison in a UN Security Council resolution, yes, this is a very serious problem. Moving on to the second part of what you're saying there, yeah, I think there will be back channels, but I think the concern when you have someone like Donald Trump is we can't be confident that all the steps that should be being taken are being taken, and that's the real worry. I was just going to say frightening times, but it is, isn't it? Yeah, I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that we'd all feel happier if this was in much more, uh, being dealt with in a much more circumspect and, and ostensibly clearly rational fashion. Time will tell. Almost no words to, to follow, is there, really? Uh, Sonny, always a pleasure. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you very much, Dom. Pleasure to be here. Sunil Rapasina, a barrister who runs uh, the road traffic defence practice, Kent Traffic Lords, BBC Radio Kent at 20 to 7.